many modern preachers set faith in sharp opposition to knowledge. Christian faith, they say, is not assent to a creed, but it is confidence in a person. The Epistle to the Hebrews, on the other hand, declares that it is impossible to have confidence in a person without assenting to a creed. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. The words, God is, or God exists, constitute a creed. They constitute a proposition. And yet, they are here placed as necessary to that supposedly non-intellectual thing that is called faith. It would be impossible to find a more complete opposition than that which here appears between the New Testament and the anti-intellectualistic tendency of modern preaching. But here, as elsewhere, the Bible is found to be true to the plainest facts of the soul. Whereas the modern separation between faith in a person and acceptance of a creed is found to be psychologically false. It is perfectly true, of course, that faith in a person is more than acceptance of a creed. But the Bible is quite right in holding that it always involves acceptance of a creed. Confidence in a person is more than intellectual assent to a series of propositions about the person, but it always involves those propositions and becomes impossible the moment they are denied. It is quite impossible to trust a person about whom one assents to propositions that make the person untrustworthy or fails to assent to propositions that make him trustworthy. Assent to certain propositions is not the whole of faith, but it is an absolutely necessary element in faith. So, assent to certain propositions about God is not all of faith in God, but it is necessary to faith in God. And Christian faith, in particular, though it is more than assent to a creed, is absolutely impossible without assent to a creed. One cannot trust a God whom one holds with the mind to be either non-existent or untrustworthy. The epistle to the Hebrews, therefore, is quite right in maintaining that he that cometh to God must believe that he is. In order to trust God or to have communion with him, we must at least believe that he exists. At first sight, this might seem to be a mere truism. It might seem to be something that every sane person would be obliged to accept. As a matter of fact, however, Even this apparently self-evident proposition is rejected by a great mass of persons in the modern world, and it has been rejected by many persons in the course of religious history. What the epistle to the Hebrews accomplishes by enunciating the simple proposition, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, is the repudiation of that important phenomenon in the history of religion that is known as mysticism. The true mystic holds that communion with God is an ineffable experience, which is independent of any intellectual propositions whatever. Religion, the mystic holds, in its pure form, is independent of the intellect. When it is expressed in an intellectual mold, it is cabined and confined. Such expression can be nothing more than symbolic. Religious experience itself does not depend upon assent to any kind of creed. In opposition to this mystical attitude, the author of the epistle to the Hebrews insists upon the primacy of the intellect. He bases religion squarely upon truth. He does not, of course, reject that immediate and mysterious contact of the soul with God, which is dear to the mystic's heart. For that immediate contact of the soul with God is a vital part of all religion worthy of the name. But he does break down the mystical separation between that experience, on the one hand, and the knowledge of God, on the other. And in doing so, he is uttering not a truism, but an important truth. He is delivering a salutary blow against anti-intellectual mysticism, ancient and modern. 